equations and dimensional analysis. Okay, I'm not going to use this term a whole lot, literal equations. Um, it's a formula or equation that involves several variables. We got a ton of these in math. Uh, we don't actually say, hey, there's a literal equation. But we have different like area, volume, all kinds of things. One of the most common ones, area of a rectangle, right? Area equals length times width. I think most people are familiar with that. And what we're going to do with that is just solve it for one of the other variables. Because right now, we, it's solved for A, right? A equals length times width. So instead of being solved for A, we could solve it for L. We could solve it for length, or we could solve it for W. So let's say I wanted to solve it for L. I wanted to get L by itself. Well, it's really L times W. So what's the inverse of doing times W to that L? Well, divide by W. And whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. So my W's would cancel. I'm left with L all by itself over here. And on the right side, I have area over the width. And I could flip it around. I could say L equals area over the width. So if I wanted to solve for the length, and I knew the area and the width, I could just take the area divided by the width. All right, and that's why we do that. Well, that's why we, we learn how to solve for different variables. So let's look at a couple tougher examples. Uh, for example, this, this one over here, number one, 5b plus 12c equals 9, and we're going to solve for b. So we don't actually get an answer like b equals 5, b equals 12, something like that, because I have two variables. So that, that variable with c is still going to be in my equation at the end, but my goal is to have b all by itself on one side of the equal sign. So I look, where's b at? It's on the left side. So what am I doing to b? I'm multiplying by 5, and I'm adding a 12c. So remember, I can't touch that 5 yet because that's connected. So i got to get rid of that 12c. Well, it's the inverse of adding by 12c, subtracting by 12c. And whatever I do to one side, I do to the other side. So let's go ahead and rewrite this. So i got 5b, that's gone, equals, well, I can't take 9 minus 12c because they're unlike terms, right? One has a c and the other one is a constant. I can't put those together. So I can write them either way. I can say 9 and then negative 12c. 9 minus 12c, or I could have wrote this as, I could put the other one first, it doesn't matter, negative 12c and a positive 9, whatever you want to do. Yeah, usually people write the variables first, uh, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to keep it in the order they were, so 9 minus 12c. And lastly, to get the b by itself, well, we're multiplying by 5, so the inverse is divide by 5. Whatever you do to one side, do to the other, cancel my 5s. So B equals, and I can leave it just like this. There's nothing more I could really do. I mean, I could split it up and take 9 over 5 minus 12C over 5. But that doesn't help me at all. So I'm just going to leave it just like this. 9 minus 12C over 5. And I'm done. I solved that equation for B. Got B by itself. So that's all we're doing. So for number 2, 7X minus 2Z equals 4 minus XY. We're going to solve it for x. If you notice, we have an x on both sides of the equal sign. Okay, We're going to throw something a little more advanced at you um, that we're going to get into later in the year. But we're not going to go too far in depth with it because it's really just uh, the opposite of our distributive property, uh, which is really factoring, but we don't get into factoring quite yet. So let's look at number two. We, we want to get the x's on one side, first of all. That's our goal. Because right, that's what we're trying to solve for. So let's get our x's onto one side with each other and move everything else away. Uh, so for example, let's get our x's on one side. Uh, you know, I got a positive 7x, so I could subtract a 7x. That's going to get kind of sloppy. Um, let's add this xy over to the other side. So I'm going to add an xy to the left side. Whatever I do to one side, I got to do to the other. So I have a 7x minus a 2z plus an xy equals 4. Okay, when you move something to one side or the other, you just add or subtract it, depending on what the inverse operation is. Well, now I would just want just my x terms. So i got to get rid of this minus 2z, so the inverse is adding 2z. Whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. And so that's gone. So I bring my 7x plus xy equals, and like I said, it doesn't matter which order. I'll just say 4 plus 2z, because that's the order they came in. So here's the tricky part. Okay, and this is what we're not going to get into until later, but um, just for now, we're just going to keep it nice and basic. So if you notice, I'm taking the 7 times x, and I'm taking the y times an x. 
So really that x is distributed to both terms. If I think about how the distributive property starts before I use it, usually the x is out front and then it gets distributed into those two terms, right? Because I take 7 times x or x times 7 and then I take x times y. Remember it gets distributed. So basically I'm doing the opposite of distributing, which we call factoring, but we're, we're not getting into it. This is just a, a, a start on it, just to give you an example. Um, so I'm pulling that x out, basically, the opposite of the distributive property. And I'm still equal to 4 plus 2z. And the reason why I do that is because now I just have 1x. I'm only dealing with 1x. And how can I solve for that 1x? Well, what am I doing to the x? I'm multiplying by the sum of 7 plus y. So the inverse would be to divide by that sum of 7 plus y. Whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. So these cancel each other. And I have x equals 4 plus 2z over 7 plus y. So that one's tougher. That one takes a little bit more work. We, we don't get into factoring yet, so it's kind of confusing. But really, it's just the opposite of the distributive property. So um, if you have trouble with that one, that's okay. That's okay, because uh, we haven't got too in-depth with the factoring step yet. Lastly, I can get it into a story problem. Um, so for example here, we have a formula for the fuel economy from a car, and that's E, which is miles per gallon, equals M over G, where M is the miles, G is the number of gallons, uh, miles per gallon, right? You probably heard your parents talk about that before. So we're going to solve the formula for M instead. So here's my formula, E equals M over G. What do you get M by itself? It's being divided by G, so the inverse is multiplied by G. Whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. So I'm left with M on the left side, or the right side, but I'm going to move it to the left, it doesn't matter. Equals G times E. Uh, however you want to put that, you can just leave it as G times E, that's fine. It's kind of sloppy with a small case next to a, a bigger case. So that works. Well, I could use that to solve some information now. If Stephen's car has an average fuel consumption of 30 miles per gallon, which is our E, right? Miles per gallon. And he uses 9.5 gallons, so that's the G. How far did he drive? Well, that's the miles, isn't it? So now I have this nice formula. I can just plug it in. M equals, well, the G was 9.5, we said. And the E, the miles per gallon, is 30. So 9.5 times 30, which gives us 28.5 miles. And so that's why we do that. That's why we can solve for any variable, because it helps us um, in situations like that. Lastly, we're going to do some dimensional analysis, or unit analysis. We're going to do some conversions. So convert 2.4 miles to inches. 2.4 miles to inches. Well, I like to use this thing called the big T. I almost make it into like a giant fraction. So I start, I'm just put a big line and a big line right here. Okay, because I'm going to have things on top and bottom in order to, to switch to inches. So what I like to do, I can't just go straight from miles to inches. I got to think about, what do I know? How many something are in miles? Well, I know how many feet are in a mile. I know how many feet are in a mile. I know that 5,280 feet are in one mile. So I make this big T because I want to get rid of miles and get to inches. But first, I got to get rid of miles and go to feet. Well, to get rid of miles, if I think about fractions, I can cross cancel, can't I? And that's why I make this big T chart. So I know my one mile should go down here so I can cross cancel my miles. And my 5,280 should go up top. Because what happens, like I said, my miles cross cancel with each other. So my two mile units cross cancel. And now I'm in feet. Well, the next step, I want to change feet to inches. So I know that there are 12 inches in a foot. So I want to cancel the feet and get to inches. So where is my, where, where's the foot going to go, the feet going to go? On the bottom, right? So we can cross cancel with the feet right, right here, the 5280. So I put one foot, which means the 12 inches goes on top. And the feet would cross cancel with each other. And we're left with just inches in the end, aren't we? which I'm trying to get to. Very good. So now I can just multiply, just like a fraction. Multiply the tops. 2.4 times 5280 times 12, which gives us 
152064. So 150,0064. And the bottom is just one times one, so I don't need to write that over one. It's the same thing. So my final answer is 152,064 inches. That's my conversion. I use that little big T. Okay, and this conversion can also be used when we convert um, actual rates. So in this case, I have 100 feet in about 2.8 seconds. So I'm going to write that just like I did as a fraction. 100 feet in 2.8 seconds. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to convert it. I want to get to miles per hour. Miles per hour. So deal with just one at a time. So maybe I'll go from feet to hour first of all. So to get rid of feet, I got to cross cancel. So I put feet on bottom. I'm going to miles. Well, in one mile, there's 5,280 feet. So feet cross cancel. I'm done there. I'm already to miles, aren't I? Good. So now let's go and get seconds to hours. Well, I know how many seconds are in a minute, and I want to get rid of seconds. So seconds are on the bottom right now. So to cross cancel, I put seconds on top, and there are 60 seconds in one minute. So now my seconds cross cancel. And now I can go from minutes to hours. So to cross cancel my minutes, they got to go on top, then which means hours are on the bottom, and there are 60 minutes in one hour. So now my uh, minutes cross cancel, and I'm left with my units I'm looking for, right? Miles per hour. And now we go through and multiply. 100 times 1 times 60 times 60. So I'm going to put that down here, which gives us... 360,000, and then we're going to multiply everything on the bottom, 2.8 times 52.80 times 1 times 1, which gives us 14,784, and then we divide those two numbers, and we end up with 24.4, because it, oh, nearest whole number, it's 3.5, so the nearest whole number is about 24, so 24 miles per hour. So there's my conversion. So if you're traveling 100 feet in every 2.8 seconds, you're approximately going 24 miles per hour. And I like to use my little big T chart, my big fraction, and keep cross canceling those units. That's my good way to keep track of everything. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Uh, and that's all I got for you. Good luck to you.